All right. Hey, family and Christ and friends. We're so glad that you're here again this week. Hopefully you're able to check out um, the similar roundtable discussion we did last week. Last week, we started off this idea of conquering COVID-19. Um, and last week, we did financially. So we had a, a panel of some friends from our church who are experts in the field with business and finances. And we just had a chance to kind of talk about what it looks like to go through uh, the crazy times that we're in financially. And this week, I wanted to circle back in and I wanted to bring in some other people from our congregation uh, and talk about just the, the whole side of emotions. You know, when we go through something like this, it's like this giant flashlight kind of all of a sudden hits us and exposes our emotional health. And, you know, sometimes uh, we feel fear or anxiety, worry, stress, um, you know, and we try to cope with these different things, sometimes in positive ways and unfortunately sometimes in negative ways as well. So what we're really hoping to do today with you is to just share some of the, um, the knowledge, the experience um, that this collective team has and, and hopefully it finds you um, in a place where it can encourage you, it can help you to maybe think differently about some of the things that you've been thinking about and to bring um, real good, um, bring more emotional health to you and your family as you guys continue to go through at least the next month or so here as we uh, continue to be in a stay at home uh, situation. Um, so I'm excited. I wanna introduce you to some uh, of our friends here. So I'm gonna switch over uh, to the gallery mode here so you can see everyone on. And so first I wanna introduce you to Pat LaPlante, if you don't already know her from our congregation, but Pat's a spiritual director and a licensed counselor. Um, she specializes in crisis and trauma intervention, and uh, she provides psychological first aid in crisis. She's a chaplain at St. Anthony's North, and as a spiritual director, she walks with people as they seek to know God more intimately. Her crisis work includes responding to mass shootings, police line of duty deaths, natural disasters, industrial accidents, um, job loss, and other emergencies. So uh, wonderful to have you on with us, Pat. Thanks for being here. Great to be here. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, let me switch over. Next, I want to introduce you to Dr. Randy Braley. Um, he's a private practice child and family psychologist in Westminster, uh, right here, licensed as a clinical psych uh, psychologist and marriage and family therapist. He is also licensed, um, he's also a licensed school psychologist working with local schools. So definitely right in the midst of everything. Welcome here, doctor. Thanks for being on with us. Well, Mitch, thank you, Pastor. Awesome, and also we have Susan Faltonson. Um, Susan has worked with a variety of human service uh, capacities after earning her master's in social work um, over 30 years ago. She has served the deaf community for over 20 years and in sign language interpretation and has been a lifelong teacher. Um, works as a camp director, children's ministry director, and college professor. So lots of fun things under her belt there. And she's, um, she's finishing specialty training in marriage and family therapy at Regis University and works as a therapist at the Center for Resilient Strategies. Um, she specializes in working with couples uh, people navigating grief and loss and difficult life transitions, um, those facing life-threatening illnesses. She also provides direct therapy services to a number, uh, to members in the deaf community who use ASL uh, to communicate. So thank you, Susan, for being here. I'm excited. It's a, it's a wonderful panel of um, people in the field who have lots of experience and um, lots of education and have been helping lots of families, local, and probably all over the world at this point. Um, you know, if you, if you don't know who I am, I'm one of the pastors here on staff at Family in Christ. Uh, they, I get to work in the areas of discipleship and deployment, but I also have a real estate background um, for 15 years and helping people do um, buying and selling and financing homes as a mortgage loan originator. Um, but I'll jump into it first. I, I also have some experience, not just on the educational and practical side, but um, also with the life skills. We've, we've been through a number of, of tough times. Um, you know, when I was working in real estate uh, only for a period of my life where I wasn't actively also in a ministry position, 
Um, it was in 2007, 8, 9, during the big crash in California. And, um, you know, we prayed hard, we worked hard, but uh, it, was, it was pretty tough times out there, especially when your commission is 100, when your livelihood is 100% commission. So we definitely went through some difficult times emotionally, you know, trying to ride that roller coaster of, um, you know, hoping for the best, fearing the worst, um, and just recognizing all of the stuff that gets churned up inside. So it was tough. We lost a house at that time. We, we had to short sale a home. And so we definitely have gone through some uh, tough times on our own. Anybody else want to share a little bit of the way that they've been kicked around in life a little bit? I would suppose that I could contribute the experience that I had in ways that involved coming to a saving knowledge of Christ. And that was in a counseling session with an individual that was mentoring me for spiritual growth. And his conclusion was that I couldn't apply what it was that he was teaching until and unless I had accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And that was on the 25th of March in 1982 at 11.30. I made that decision to follow Christ. And I was told thereafter by Dr. Theodore Kalaga that I needed to get ready and have my tools at my disposal and God would find me work. And he's done so ever since. And I'm grateful and privileged to be here doing these kinds of things on behalf of the kingdom. And I would offer in addition to what Ms. LaFant offered. And that's that I've been privileged to do that work internationally. I've been in uh, Istanbul, Turkey with the World uh, Congress and that I was supposed to be in um, the first week of March in Basel, Switzerland, but it was canceled because of the coronavirus. I've also worked in the Columbine Connections after the shootings at Columbine High School, working with parents and families that were trying to restore normalcy and stabilize some sort of um, the psychological well-being to their children, recognizing that things will never be the same for that child that was exposed to the trauma of those shootings and killings. I was also privileged to go into Haiti after the earthquake and work with the missionary team, uh, ministering to the pastors in port au prince And I was wondering what possible use could I be of God to be in Haiti after this um, calamitous earthquake. And I, the pastors and the congregations in port au prince and other parts of Haiti were so very privileged to have a doctor coming into their presence. And at that time I was working as a child and family psychologist at Children's Hospital. So wherever it is that God has called me to go, I've been willing to do so. And I follow after uh, Jacob, or um, uh, who is it that uh, went into the promised land as uh, God was directing Joshua and Caleb. And he, they said, uh, where you send me there, I will go. And that's my mantra as well. Mm, awesome. Well, thank you. Um, ladies, anybody else? Have, have you gone through some, some of the personal hard times yourselves at all? Is life? Oh, sure. Um, I experienced some abuse as a tween, I guess they call them now. And years later, it was still um, very troubling to me. I ended up being hospitalized for depression. And uh, it was a very difficult time. Um, there were many, many things things that really hurt a lot and yet God brought me through all of it and now I am happy to say that I have something that most people don't have. I have papers that say I'm sane. <laughs> Amen. Awesome. Susan, how about you? Yeah, so um, about five years ago I, I felt the calling to finally do what I'd been trained to do so many years ago, which is to become a therapist. And so I started back to Regis to kind of brush up on my therapy tools. And it was that semester that I found out I had cancer. Mm -hmm. And recently I was um, reflecting on going through this time now. And what I'm realizing is that some of the same feelings I had when I first found out I had cancer are similar to my initial feelings with dealing with the COVID-19 crisis, which was, how could this happen? And seemingly overnight, it was definitely... Wow. Um, it just came out of nowhere when I was diagnosed with cancer. And, and it seems like what we're currently going through also a bit came out of nowhere. So I think I've, um, over these last five years, as I've been moving into working as a therapist, I really realized that one of my callings is to work with people going through tough transitions. Mm -hmm. And we're going through a really tough time and a really tough transitional time. So, um, so I'm, I'm feeling like, uh, you know, God uses everything for something in your life that's important. And at the time, I, I really um, was, was caught off guard to be walking the cancer journey. 
and as I still, as a survivor, walk down the road of, of medical uncertainty, um, God's brought me through that, mm. and God's mm. going to get me through this. Amen. Wow. Wow. Thank you each for uh, just kind of sharing a little bit of where you're at and, and what, what's going on in your world. Um, you know, I, I believe deeply that God has given us um, emotions um, on purpose. Yeah. And not just the good ones. I believe that all of them are designed by God in order to help us to navigate life and to live the way that he's called us to. Um, you know, I'm not sure how many of you watch uh, kids movies as much, but we recently just rewatched a movie inside. I think it's called Inside Out. Yeah. It's a great, yeah. it's such a great yeah. movie. Um, you know, of just all the different emotions that are, that are going on inside this character's brain and, and mm-hmm. not to give away too much of the movie for those who may not have seen it yet, even though it's an older movie, but the reality is, is that all of them come into play and God wants to use them all. But oftentimes, you know, especially in the church world, we kind of feel like we're always supposed to be happy or we're always supposed to be up and don't necessarily recognize how all of the other emotions are supposed to be the way that I kind of think about it is like dash lights on our car, you know, that they go off and they tell us that something deeper is happening inside our heart and inside of our life that God wants us to pay attention to. And so oftentimes we don't realize where this fear or anxiety or worry or stress or different things are coming from, but they're there in order for, um, to get our attention so that way we can do inner work with God and, and figure out life. But I do have some uh, wonderful panelists on with us today, so I'm not going to steal too much of the time. But what I'm going to do next is just kind of go around and just ask some different questions to each of you and let you have a chance to kind of talk about um, all of this from your perspective and offer the things that God has kind of put on your, on your heart. So Pat, we'll start with you. How can we take care of ourselves and our loved ones when we feel like maybe we're standing on shifting sand? Hmm. Well, um... Part of the problem with what is going on in the world is that it is so transitory. What, what's true now was not true five minutes ago and may not be true in an hour. So um, that is part of the problem because we feel so out of control, so out of control. And even when, quote unquote, the experts tell us what they think is correct or appropriate, we're still not sure that that's going to be what's uh, accurate in a few hours or a few days. One example is the idea of everyone wearing masks. First they said, no, 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 don't do that. We need the hospital people to have the masks. But now they are thinking that that might be a good idea because that will help uh, protect other people from us. It will keep our germs inside. Uh, It's not so much that it'll protect us from other people. Um, so now they are rethinking that. So before it was no, no masks. Now it's maybe. Uh, same thing with shelter in place. Well, let's do it until April 1st. Now it's till April 30th. So things are going to constantly change. And because of that, we have very little sense of security. We don't know what's going to happen next. And we're creatures that like to know what's happening next. Mm. So um, the way we can take care of ourselves in that kind of a situation is first of all, to realize that we have already started to adapt. So Mm -hmm. if you think about how you felt 10 days, two weeks ago, compared to how you feel now, I'm sure you will see some kind of a difference. It's not quite so strange and new and different. Um, you can actually see that you have started to make these changes, small as they might be, but it's starting to feel less awkward. It's starting to feel more um, typical that, okay, I know I'm not going to go to work today, but what am I going to do? So you've already started to adapt and you have lived through other crises in the past, whether it's the personal crisis of somebody dying or a major illness, or it's a national crisis like 9-11 or some of the wars that we have been through. You have gotten through those times. Going through them, it seems like it's the worst possible thing. And yet you have gotten through them. And you have seen how God has worked through those things to help grow you, strengthen you. I'm not saying it's pleasant, 
<laughs> but I am saying that um, he certainly can use uh, all of these circumstances. So I think first starting to realize that you're already doing pretty well because you've already started to adapt. Now, <clears throat> you can't control much of this. So what you want to do is focus on what you can manage. For example, your whole life has changed now, so you probably want to do uh, things that will kind of keep you grounded. One of those might be um, set a schedule. That doesn't mean you have to stick to it forever, but have a starting point. Get up, take a shower, get dressed, even if you're not going anywhere, because that will help you to retain some kind of, quote, normalcy in your life. Uh, set a goal for the day. Think about what is it that I want to accomplish today. Don't set 25 goals. You'll never do them all. Set one. And if you do that, great. Um, <clears throat> think in categories. So for example, you might think, okay, physically, um, I want to exercise for a half hour today. Um, emotionally, I want to uh, think about why I'm feeling so anxious. Financially, I want to check and see what kind of resources I have to, so that I can be able to pay the bills. And so it's these kinds of uh, categories. If you think in categories and think about one thing you would like to accomplish in those categories, I think that could also be very helpful. Um, and of course, there are many other things you can do, but everyone is resourceful. Uh, but that's just kind of the, the idea of make a schedule, do things that um, are things you would typically do anyway, and then um, just keep on keeping on. So good, that's so good, thank you. That's awesome, all right, let's uh, move around. Dr. Braley, what does yes, brain science and neuroanatomy have to do with thoughts and feelings? Well, I would begin by echoing the sentiments of Ms. LaPlante and that it has everything to do with how mindful are we of what it is that we're experiencing both within and from without. And when we think about what's taking place for us with regard to this pandemic, we recognize it as an invisible enemy. So in my private practice, as well as with students in the schools, I teach an understanding of the way in which our minds or our brains function. And God has equipped us in very unique ways to be able to understand and identify emotions. And those feelings are what emanate from the amygdala. It's a part of the brain structure that houses feelings and emotions, but also behavior. So they are memories recalled with feelings attached, and then they are at times what drive or dictate behaviors that follow. So we have a school-based curriculum called uh, BrainWise, and I teach it there as well for these young people so that the students in the um, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th grades can begin to understand the way in which they function uh, as a human being so they can practice improved mental and emotional health and wellness as well. So when we think about the other part of the anatomy of our brain that makes up the um, part of brain science that's taught in the same curriculum, it has to do with the prefrontal cortex. And in this curriculum, one, the amygdala is referred to as the lizard brain where all of our emotions lie. And for teenagers, that's what drives their decision-making. And then when we talk about the uh, prefrontal cortex, we're talking about the part of our brain that is literally um, the wizard brain. It's where our rational thinking, our organized planning is uh, housed and it's what will override our feelings. But as um, Ms. LaFlante offered, we need to be aware of the feelings that we're experiencing and where they are derived from so that we can then understand what it is that's triggering or activating those feelings and then go in the direction of being able to manage them and control them and do something in a way that's adaptive. So when we talk about an invisible enemy that is the COVID virus, we have to be able to understand, first and foremost, what we are experiencing that is um, not only a global pandemic, but how is it that it's turned our world upside down and inside out? And again, I speak of that from personal experience and private and practical experience in my practice of having to go to exclusive teletherapy. And as a person from my generation, the baby boomers are not as well equipped to deal with the um, technology that's required. And so that's been a hair on fire experience for me going forward, as well as working with the students and staff in the schools that I work out of that have to deal with um, 
distance learning or online learning and virtual classrooms. And so all of those things have been challenging me. And initially, Pastor, I didn't want to have to deal with it. I was saying, this sucks. Um, I'd rather just not do it. I'm going to do something else and realize that um, this is beyond the, the scope of my expertise. I don't have the knowledge. And then I realized that this is a learning opportunity for me. If I'm not asking it of me, how can I possibly ask it of these students? So what we're also identifying in the utilization of those kinds of um, anatomical awarenesses is to take what we know, apply it. And at the beginning of the application really begins with the understanding of what we're losing and where is it that grief is taking place? How is it we're saddened by the things that are taking place? And what emotions are surfing, surfacing for us in that area of our brain that we understand to be um, emotionally focused, whether we call it the amygdala or whether we call it the lizard brain. There are emotions that are surfacing. Are they anger? Are they fear? Are they uh, anxiety? All of which are God created earlier, Pastor. And how we manage them is going to be to his glory and to the growth and uh, to the management of our internal world and the contribution of uh, the ways in which we can choose to become more adaptive. So those experiences of grief and loss, we have to be able to do that with one another as a community. We have to be able to come together and take what grief and loss is by representation. It's an internal experience of what we believe, what we have, and we have thoughts about the experience. And it is a life and death exposure and threat. And my wife just this morning learned that our next door neighbor was identified as having contracted the virus. So he is now positive in quarantine. That's the closest wow. the virus has come to my wife and I and our family. We're grateful for that. She was seeking to reach out to this individual and did so. And so we'll continue to do what we can in support of that family from a distance, of course, um, at least yeah. six feet. So as we think about the grief and the loss experience, it's God intended that we have those feelings. Yet what we need to do with them in a functional and adaptive way is take them into the community, take them into the relationship opportunities that are there for us. That's when it becomes mourning. When we make it publicly known how we're feeling, what we're experiencing, what are our thoughts? That's when as a community, family in Christ and the the community at large and even the global community can begin to work on what it is that's being experienced so that it can be overcome and surmounted always with the end result being um, the improvement of our quality of life. Nothing enters into our lives but that it has already passed through the permissive hand of the God Almighty that is still sovereign, still on the throne. He foreknew this pandemic. He foreknows the timeline of it. He knows the, the date and time of how it will be that we experience it, whether it's through our exposure and a positive identification of having contracted the virus and or whether or not it's going to lead to our own death. And my wife and I have had that conversation. We've talked about whether or not we are ready to die. If this is how God calls us home, it has to be an acceptance and a surrender because our days are numbered. And he tells us as much as good. he knows when, where, and how we will be called home. And I resonate with what uh, Ms. Susan offered. I was diagnosed with, um, prostate cancer in 2015. Mm -hmm. And it was initially a shock and it was um, something unexpected, quite real. Um, it'd been an ongoing management of my holistic health, which is my mantra. How do we teach? How do we preach? How do we practice medical and physical health and wellness? How do we practice mental and emotional health and wellness? How do we practice uh, relational health and wellness? And how do we practice spiritual health and wellness? When I was diagnosed, I had to start thinking about all of the repercussions of losing my prostate and losing all of the things that attend to that as a man. And I realized that um, I was good to go. I didn't let fear enter in after the initial diagnosis. And I had a wonderful born again Christian as a urologist. He helped me move through the initial stages of the management of that condition. It turned out that I was um, a candidate that uh, had a low level of the metastasizing uh, cancer and that the ultimate decision was to remove the organ, and it was taken out. I had a prostatectomy, and um, I am now uh, symptom-free. I don't think about it. I don't pay attention to it. And I realized then and now that I will have to find, God will have to find another way to, to call me home, and I'll have to die from something <laughs> other than prostate cancer, and I'm okay with that. So my awareness comes from the way in which my feelings can be overwhelming. They can be to an extreme, yet... God intends that our anxiety be in some way manageable, that anxiety is a barometer for what's going on outside and from within. And then there, there's a curvilinear relationship. It's a matter of reaching a point of diminishing return 
If we get too anxious, it compromises our capacity to function. If we have sufficient anxiety, it heightens our awareness and our attentiveness. Then we can manage it, monitor it, and mobilize and do something productive with it. So our emotions are all intended for our well-being and they're intended of God to be created for our gain. Fear is not from the Lord our God. Fear is from the enemy. And we know that my scriptures promise that we've not been given a spirit of timidity, but a power and love and discipline. And that discipline is that sound mind that we must all practice and do so as an act of our will, not because we feel like it. Hmm. <laughs> good thoughts, doctor. Good thoughts. Um, can I play with them, some of those for a little bit before we move on? Please do, Pastor. So the the, the limbic system with the amygdala uh, traps a lot of our past, and it traps a lot of the feelings and the emotions, especially other crisis uh, moments that we've lived through, other trauma experiences. Um, they're all they're all in there. So when something like this happens, we're almost re-traumatized and that kind of stuff gets brought back to the front. So how would you talk to people thinking through and trying to recognize whether some of their current emotional, um, I don't know, heightened, like when our emotions yeah. are heightened, how can we tell if we're operating out of a, the limbic or out of the frontal cortex? How do we recognize that, that tension and what do we do with that? Uh, that's an excellent question. And I appreciate how mindful you are and how psychologically minded you are as a pastor. And uh, it warms my heart to hear you speak. When we think about the way in which we are re-experiencing a traumatic event, um, I literally did my dissertation research at the Children's Hospital in that area of trauma that comes from being vicariously exposed called secondary traumatic stress and or experiencing vicarious trauma or compassion fatigue. And what we know is that when there is uh, a re-triggering or an activation of um, old trauma wounds, as they resurface, we'll know whether or not we're experiencing uh, distancing and difficulty with intimacy or closeness, or whether we are feeling psychically numb and not willing or able to access the feelings or the emotions that would otherwise be arising. So it is important to both recognize with the help of a loved one, an accountability partner, if you will, whether or not there are ways in which we are withdrawing, isolating, uh, suppressing. And those are ways that the mind ends up becoming uh, defensive on its own behalf to keep things from resurfacing. But that very resurfacing that you offered is a way in which the healing can take place. And I use what's called narrative theory or narrative therapy. It's re-experiencing and it's restoring. It's telling what you suffered then in a new way, in a new frame, with a clear understanding of what was done unto you or what you experienced, or what might have even been self-inflicted. And as you revisit that, you have the awareness that the surfacing of the emotions, and then you need to name those feelings, name them as fear, name them as um, anger, um, and then know what to do with them in such a way that allows you to grow through and beyond what's been suffered or endured. So it does happen, and, and it is, um, it's a miracle, and it's, it's mystical in and of itself in all ways. So I appreciate your question. So for me personally, um, sometimes, you know, like the whole fear of loss, going through um, losing your house and all that type of stuff, and going through a financial crisis um, back in 08 and 09, I think some of that stuff still comes up today where I don't realize um, some of the feelings, you know, like were of restlessness or of anxiety or some of those things. So what are some questions? Um, I'll use myself as an example. What would be questions that like other people who love me in my life could ask me questions so that way I'm not um, put on the defense? Like, man, Regan, you seem like you're really, you know, like that would... Put some, but how, how do you ask someone if they're being triggered or what, what are some helpful ways to help other people explore what's kind of going deeper um, within that battle? Is that a question you're asking of me, Pastor? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that, again, it has everything to do with the vulnerability that we're admonished to practice. And there's a psychologist that's in the forefront of the work right now that has done extensive research on that kind of vulnerability and transparency that comes from our ability and our willingness to talk about what has happened to us in the past and what it's doing to us as a result of that past wounding, that past 
uh, suffering of loss or victimization, whatever it might have been, how able we are to be able to go there and say, this is what happened to me then. It's still mm -hmm. a part of the fabric of my makeup. And if we have someone that's close to us, they know our history. They know the things we've gone through in the past. And they know whether we're pulling away or closing off and becoming more distant and not being transparent or vulnerable in the acknowledgement of what's being re-experienced so that they, with us, can create that kind of security and that kind of affective bond, which is curative, so that they know and we know this is where I'm at again, yet I can suffer it and endure it differently and be an overcomer in Christ Jesus, not be a victim, but be someone that can identify, understand, and move through in ways that are uh, curative and healing by which God intends it to be. That's so good. Um, I think what I love about that is, is that when we go through things that re-traumatize us in different ways, it's not that God wants us to be hurt again, but Amen. I think it's, it's ways that he wants us to expose that there are hurts that haven't been healed. So for some of the people, you know, as you're listening and watching, um, I think the practical takeaway here is just to try to look deeper at what's going on and what things are being churned up and then be able to work with a, a spouse or a pastor or um, somebody who's licensed in order to help you to work through some of those different um, wounds that we bring into all of our current daily life and relationships with others. So thank you, Dr. Susan, I don't want to have you just sit there for too long without having a chance to join here in our conversation. So let me move on to you. Um, Susan, what are some of the different ways that you see in your practice and in your life and in your education that we that would help us to be able to navigate some of these changes and and transitions into our new nor having a hard time saying this because i don't want it to be a new normal but into yes. our new normal right right well i think that what i'm hearing a lot as i'm working with folks is just the emotions that are coming up for people and some people People are caught off guard by the emotions that they're feeling and others are trying to work around it they don't want to feel the feels so to speak mm -hmm. um, they they just want to get on task and and get to mm -hmm. work and work off a list and check things off and others are feeling really guilty that they're not getting anything done and they're saying well I, I get up in the morning and I just sit in front of my computer and I fire off a few emails and then I want to just watch TV or veg out or play video games. And I feel horrible about myself at the end of the day. Mm. And so um, when, I, when I'm working with folks, I'm reminded of words that were spoken to me years ago that were so impactful. I have a few little um, objects to show you. So this is a phrase that means a lot to me. Be gentle with yourself. And I've spoken it to many clients that I work with. I have to remind myself to be gentle with myself because I think a lot of times we get caught up in all the shoulds of things we should do. I should, I should, I should, I should. And then at the end of the day, we might feel that we didn't measure up to what we thought we should do. And so just allowing ourselves to recognize that this is a time of a lot of feelings, reactions, changes, uncertainty, like Pat was saying, the loss of control is so huge. Um, to be willing to just sit with God and to be gentle with ourselves as he is gentle with us. Um, for me, along my journey, some of the things that have been helpful for me when I find myself sort of walling myself away from emotion is to listen to music. And so um, a couple of the, of the um, songs that have been impactful for me just in the last few years, one comes to mind, which is by Danny Gokey, and it's called Tell Your Heart to Beat Again. And so who knows, that song might speak to somebody um, I'll date myself by the next one, which is an Amy Grant song, uh, Better Than a Hallelujah. And it just talks about um, reaching out to God in our moment of, of just need and how for God, that's better than a hallelujah sometimes because he is there for us when we're feeling the feelings or we're running from the feelings. And um, so I think for me, that, that's one of the things that really comes to mind is, is being gentle with myself and um, not running from the feelings, not being swamped by the feelings. And ultimately, it's God that's going to help us navigate what we're going through. Uh, that's so good. So um, my follow-up question is, Is are you mass producing those? I mean, where can I get one? 
I, I actually found it in a hospital gift shop of all places. And I right. walked by it and I thought, I must have it. <laughs> well, if there's anyone out there um, from last week who's lost some in income, you might want to switch back, um, you know, and, and make some of those and you can probably do well selling those okay. online here. So um, good. You want to say some more, Susan, on, along those lines? You know, I think, uh, I think that's it for that particular topic. I've got some other thoughts as we continue on in our discussion as well. All right, good. All right, Miss Pat, um, let me see here, uh, unmute. Um, Pat, let's talk about spiritual formation. Let's talk about um, what is spiritual formation? How does that help someone to um, become the, the whole version of themselves that God has designed and created them to be? How does, how does spiritual formation help in this area of combating some of our anxieties and the feelings that, you know, we're out of control? Wow, that's a great question. Um, actually, I don't know who said it originally, but it's not original with me. We are not humans that... Um, that walk around as um, people and have a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings that have, are having a human experience. Mm. And really God is present in every action and circumstance of our lives. So um, I think uh, part of uh, spiritual formation in a situation like this is first of all, knowing what is going on. And by that, I mean, know the facts. Um, I was a news director for uh, quite a number of years in radio, and the news business has a saying, if your mother says she loves you, check it out. In other words, don't take anything anyone says at face value. So what I'm recommending here is you find out the truth about things. Go to credible sources. Um, go to uh, the, the uh, Center for Disease Control, go to National Institutes of Health. And I think you said we, we have some of these resources that you're going to list. Uh, correct me again? Yeah, we'll have so, in the comment section, especially on Facebook here, we'll link a bunch of different things as we, as we keep going. So after okay. this airs, um, we'll start to have some of those links for people to circle back to. Okay, great. And that is even biblical because when um, uh, David was choosing his, the, the um, people to be some of his mighty men, he chose Issachar. Issachar was the one who understood the times. We need to understand the times. So first of all, go to credible sources. Know what is true. I, I can't emphasize that enough. Then think about what, again, what things of those you can control. Um, you know, it, it's been mentioned before. If you're feeling a certain way, name that emotion. Because you know what? You're right. God gave us all of our emotions. They're not good or bad. They are all emotions and they all serve a purpose. If you know how you are doing emotionally, you can bring that to God. He wants to be there with you in it. Uh, so that's really, really important. Uh, spiritual formation has a lot of pieces to it. It means taking care of yourself um, physically. You know, eat real food. A, a, a cigarette and a cup of coffee are not a nutritious breakfast. <laughs> you need real food. You need to drink water. Um, you need to uh, know what is going on inside of you as well as outside of you. Then you can take this to... Um, further, uh, a, a deeper level, if you will, of, of spiritual formation. Um, you want to find a balance. Don't watch the news 24 seven. Don't play ostrich and stick your head in the sand. So stay up to date, maybe two or three times a day. Once you know kind of what's going on for you and for the world around you, Think about how you can use those things to connect with God. Some people uh, journal, and a journal doesn't have to be where you sit down and write pages and pages. You can take something as simple as a calendar and write one thing you are thankful for every day. It doesn't have to be a whole sentence. I promise you the grammar police will not come chase you. So 
write something in a journal every day. Um, the shortest pencil is longer than the longest memory. Uh, worship God, and that's uh, important. Everything that we do can be considered worship. Uh, you can sing hymns, you can write hymns, you can write a psalm. Um, you can learn to meditate, and meditation is not a waste of time, but it is a difficult skill to learn, so don't give up after a day or a week or a month. Uh, but there are a lot of apps and so forth that teach you how to do some of these things. Um, <clears throat> make sure that you are engaging the rest of your family members. For example, um, if, if you want to uh, engage your family in, in some kind of spiritual formation, maybe have the kids act out a parable. Um, one exercise that I have really enjoyed is select a parable from one of the Gospels and put yourself in the scene and then write about it. Um, if you are watching Jesus multiply loaves and fishes, are you one of the disciples? Are you the little boy with the food? Are you an onlooker? Are you a for different aspects you can look at this from? And then remember that um, the, the Word of God is just full of so many things. You can take an emotion or a principle and you can do a word study. You can take the emotion of anxiety or you can take the principle of peace and just go through scripture and find the places where scripture talks about those things and meditate on those things. Think about those things. Maybe memorize uh, some scripture verses or so. Um, there are many, many things you can do, but that's just a little a little taste. Mm, thanks. So spiritual formation, just like if I were to do bodybuilding, I would be working on um, trying to build my muscles. If I'm doing spiritual formation, I'm trying to partner and cooperate with God in order to build my spirit. Would that be right? But that's a good way to, to, to put it. Yes. Um, you're, then, you're trying to, to deepen your intimacy with God. Okay. And then the way that we choose to go through these different trials plays into our spiritual formation, really, whether we're being present to it or not, right? Yes, very true. Very true. Because we can go through experiences almost as an observer and be very uh, shut down. You know, as, uh, as we were mentioning earlier, the different emotions that flow through the amygdala and all of that. Uh, you can go through things very shut down, but you're not really living life. You're not really experiencing it. And with spiritual formation, what you are doing is you are presenting all of who you are to God. So the better you know you, the better you experience you, the more deeply you will have intimacy with God. Yeah, that's good. Um... You know, we talk about that the Holy Spirit's role in our life is to bring about this transformation. I love Dallas Willard has this little phrase. He says that transformation isn't opposed to effort. It's opposed to earning. So we don't, we don't earn from God when we sit with him in these different spiritual transformation um, processes or, or practices. But um, it's not opposed to our, our effort. Like there's, there's God's part in this and then there's our part in this. And somehow beautifully... We dance together in such a way that the Holy Spirit brings about the fruit of a greater sense of love and joy and peace, and patience and kindness. And sometimes, you know, I feel like in some church circles or just some of the things that we tend to pick up when we go to church or just think about religious type things is just this idea of trying harder. Like I got to try harder to not be angry or try harder to not be whatever, fill in the gap. And usually that doesn't work, at least not for long. You know, it's, it's like this balloon that's pushed underneath the surface of the water that as soon as you take your eye off it, it pops up someplace else and then we, we see it come. So, the, so spiritual formation, if I'm right, Pat, is this idea of allowing God to shrink the air out of that balloon so that way it doesn't pop up in different ways in our life. That, would that be close? That's, yes, that, that's a very good way to put it. And as you were mentioning, information is not transformation. We can know something, but if we do not let it change our lives, what's the point of even knowing it? You need to put into practice what it is you have learned. 
And I think that's that both and there that we see those tensions in scripture. It's almost never the or. It's almost always this plus this together working. Um, good. All right. Uh, that probably leads into some of your stuff again, doctor. So let's see here. What role does uh, family systems play in the management of, uh, you know, a crisis and a pandemic? You know, emotionally focused parenting and the ecology of the family and some of that type of stuff. And, and what I love about this question is, is just the reality that families are being forced to live in tight knit community with each other without an outlet. And so the amount of um, bickering, quarreling, fighting, parents fighting in front of their kids, parents uh, potentially taking out their anger, their frustration on their kids, kids not having the ability to go and have all those same luxuries with their friends and, and you know, their new normal. So what can you say to all of that to help our families out there? Uh, part of what I'm going to um, interject will be coming full circle from some of the questions you asked earlier, but in trying to think of what I wanted to say in my second question, I was uh, preoccupied with what I was hearing from my colleagues on the panel and how impressive what they're contributing has been so far. Um, I would identify first the phenomenon of metacognition, and we know that to be uh, a higher level of awareness for how we think, and I teach that with all the patients that I work with and even the students to know what they're thinking, and that's where the empowerment begins for any of us to have an awareness of the thoughts that we're entertaining so that we know whether or not they do the following. And I always share with the families that I work with and even the Christian students, the um, verses out of 2 Corinthians, and it would be chapter 10, verses 3, 4, and 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal or fleshly, but mighty unto God for pulling down the strongholds. And I've learned those strongholds are demonically induced patterns of thinking. And we are to cast down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So what would God have us do as a family? He would have us recognize the role that parents play in providing a safe and a protective environment in the times of catastrophic um, intrusions of something like the pandemic of the coronavirus. So the family is a holding place. It's a it's a setting where emotions can be expressed and felt but by virtue of what the parents are doing. They're teaching their children how to experience those emotions, how to identify them and name them, as uh, Pat offered momentarily, uh, and then take them into the fabric of their awareness and learn how to not only regulate them by the identification, but control them and not be controlled by their feelings. I didn't have that privilege in my upbringing. So when I talk about myself and do self-disclosure with uh, families and also students, I let it be known that the way in which I was raised was devoid of the full array of human emotions, and it was punctuated by anger or withdrawal. And uh, those are painful experiences for me even today. So uh, mm -hmm. out of my mindfulness, keep on top of that with the individuals that I work with, the couples and the families. I go to a family system from a strength-based and a solution-focused perspective. And I am a part of the family system when I'm doing care and uh, treatment, irrespective of what's being presented. I treat the family as my unit of care. I look at the individual or the couple in their families of origin, in their birth families. How are they raised? How are they nurtured? What did they lack? What did they have in the ways that were insufficient? And how can they use that awareness and that mindfulness to introduce into their family the ability to be emotionally focused with their children and to come to them in a way that is comforting and may distract them, but help them understand that the feelings they're experiencing are understandable and part of the human condition God intended. What do they do with those feelings? So I teach that I first have to bring calm and some sort of um, peace and tranquility, if you will, by virtue of the spirit to a family setting. But the emotions that are intense that are coming up, they have to be recognized and then managed and then moved through so that a parent can be a source of problem solving for their children, creating within the ecology of the family, a place of nurturance and a place, a place again, of, of safety and, and well-being. Um, I was kiddingly referred to as Dr. Genogram in my doctoral program because I do um, a genealogy. I do a family uh, structure by family tree with every individual couple and family that I work with so that I can understand how they relate to one another. What's the structure and the hierarchy of the family? 
so that the parents are responsible. That's parent empowerment. They're responsible for the rules that are set, the guidance they provide for their children that are the establishment of safety and security because they're known rules, ideally, and the children know what to follow. The children, as they become adolescents, they participate in the establishment of those rules and the uh, sustainment of them and the enforcement of them and the consequences for failing to meet those rules. But again, the structure of the family is based on the hierarchy that is God intended. Parents at the top, first uh, husband and wife as the dyad, then mother and father as the secondary dyad, and then the subsystem are the children. It can't be an inverted hierarchy. It can't be where the parents are relying upon the children for comfort or encouragement or well-being. The parents first have to be that kind of available source of calm and stability to their children, teaching them about what God intends them to experience from this pandemic, because it's all God intended for what we learn and how we apply it and the way in which it's managed. So God will use it, and God intends that it be used for the gain and the benefit of our well-being going forward. It's intended to nurture us. And I use it uh, when I go back to Genesis and I think about Joseph and the way in which uh, a global epidemic and uh, food shortage caused the um, Israelites and his family to leave uh, Israel and um, migrate to um, Egypt, where Joseph ended up becoming the prime minister of all of Egypt after having been sold into slavery. What did he end up becoming and doing? Uh, the source of the provision of need to his family. And he named his children accordingly, Manasseh and uh, uh, his other son's name. And a blank on me. Um, Ephraim. Ephraim and Manasseh, one being um, God has caused me to uh, forget the troubles of my father's household, the other name being, and God has caused me to uh, plenish or flourish in the land of my affliction. So uh, I take heart at that. And when Joseph was reconciled to his brothers, what did he say to them when they feared that he was going to take out uh, his anger and his upset by retribution? He said to them, no, it's God's uh, purpose that's being served. The enemy intended it for evil, but God intended it that many lives might be saved. There is death and there is dying going on around us. How does that motivate us to come closer to God? How does that motivate us to come closer to scripture and apply scripture to the solutions of our pandemic exposure? So family is everything. The family structure is everything. Structure equals function. And that's what I bring to parents. And that's what I bring to children. It's what I bring to the students in the schools as well. Okay, so... That also somewhat could assume to our listeners that family means the normal two-parent structure. So what would you interject with the reality that that's not necessarily the norm? Um, thank you for that question. And forgive me if I neglect to bring in the variations that are now before us. We know that there are variations that are God intended and or God permitted that do involve uh, blended families, do involve uh, generations coming together, um, the family that is the community that we have that's family in Christ. Uh, I think of uh, Pat as um, an older adult who is a single adult and how it is that she creates community for herself. I think we're responsible for our brother. We are our brother and our sister's keeper. So I think that we can gain our relationship um, benefit and blessing from that kind of created or constructed family system. Um, and again, where relationship is realized, therein is the, the nurturance and the sustainment or the cultivation of our well-being. So across the lifespan, I look at each individual. I look at the family across the life cycle to see how it is that individuals have come to that place in time where they are in a different place than maybe they intended or a different place than uh, they had hoped or prayed for. But there still is the opportunity for us as a family with our mindfulness in Christ to turn to those people and bring them into what we do. I was single for 20 plus years after going through a painful and unwanted divorce. I had been in seminary believing that God was going to call me to the ministry of marriage and family therapy in the church. That door closed against me because of circumstances that were conspiring against me. It broke my heart. I thought, Lord, how could you do that? How could you allow what you told me to do and be to be lost of me? It turned out that that was a blessing in disguise. I landed in a, a Jesuit school learning about marriage and family therapy. So those 20 years that I spent single, I spent learning how to love in the way that was Christ-like, learning how to bring the fruits of the Holy Spirit to bear upon all relationships. And I learned a lot about myself and my ability to give a different kind of love to another. And over the course of those years, 
I gained additional education. My parents neither were graduates of high school. My father, he dropped out in 10th, my mother in 11th dropouts and married in um, short order, having four children in six years, children raising children. So I look at that and say, Lord, you have blessed me beyond measure. I have five degrees, two undergraduate degrees, two master's degrees, and a doctorate. And my parents were uneducated. So am I blessed? Yes, I am. Am I privileged? Yes, I am. So I believe that my work is my calling. And God has appointed me to do this work as a wounded healer. And mm -hmm. I turn to them when they need. And when they come to me, I give them what I am. Part of what I give them is my disclosure of my own brokenness and my own wounding. And therein lies an opportunity for us to minister to whomever it might be, however they call themselves, single, married, divorced, uh, widowed, whatever it might be. My remarriage to my present wife is a gift. She's a blessing undeserved. She went through her own widowhood experience, losing her husband to failed liver transplant by two. And my wife has lost a son, her firstborn son, lost to uh, congenital disease and then ultimately to cancer in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. The family of Christ reached out to us. They ministered to us. And she and I have made our way through that. But that's the depth of her wounding that she ministers out of. And uh, I'm blessed to have her at my side. Wow. No, thank you, doctor, for all that. That's, yeah, beautiful. Thank you. Um, hmm. Um, Susan, we're going to transition to you again, and um, I'm going to let you talk about um, your question, but I'm going to throw you a little bit of a curveball here, just something that I've been thinking about. Yeah, right. Is, um, on top of, uh, you know, the idea of how do we live in healthy relationships with one another, sometimes in close quarters. Also, what would you say, um, especially to parents, uh, out there who know that they can slip into abusive behavior, um, whether that's, uh, and there's going to be a big pendulum swing on that, right? From, from being kind of uh, strict with your kid to all the way into, you know, verbally or physically being abusive. And whether or not they think it's abusive, I, I, I would imagine that most people who slip into that or aren't paying attention to the stuff underneath the surface and then end up taking it out on someone else in their family, I would imagine that they feel hopefully pretty beaten up by shame and guilt afterwards. Um, but then again, if they're not dealing and tending to that, it's a repeating cycle that can lead to addictions and lead to a, a horrible downward spiral. So can you speak to all of that for me? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, as a mom of two emerging young adults, um, listening to Dr. Braley talk about the amygdala, I like lizard to wizard, because I've watched my kids emerge into more of that prefrontal cortex, um, especially as they're getting into their 20s. And one of the things that I think I've learned finally as a mom is that um, I, I need to have more grace with my children, with my with my husband, with my family. Um, I was sitting in a, in a session recently with a couple and they were just pushing back at each other. And I just, I wrote this word on a piece of paper and I flipped it around and I said, what does this word mean? And it was the word grace. So of course I brought with me. My <laughs> and, and it really is about grace. Um, in psychology, I teach you know, entry-level psychology, and we talk about confirmation bias. You look for that thing that you expect to, um, to validate your own beliefs or your own frame or your own way of looking at something. So um, you know, if I look at my child and I think, yeah, well, you're the one that always forgets to put away the milk and you're the one that always um, leaves your cell phone out in the rain and you're the one that does this. I'm looking for more confirmation that even though it's not intentional, as a, as a mom, I definitely remember those times when I had a kid who would typically do this and this and this and this. Interestingly enough, me and that child recently took personality tests. We are exactly the same. <laughs> so sometimes the things that bothers us the most are maybe Maybe the mirror things that we know about ourselves, but we can't quite, we can't quite deal with that. Mm 
So I've learned, and I'm still learning along the way, that if I am going to look for something, I will surely find it. But I can look for the positive and find that, or I can look for the things that I'm quite sure are negative traits. So thinking about living in relationship to the people that are in our current household, those that we're, we're in stay-at-home orders with, um, my challenge to myself and to all of us is to look for the things that are positives and to have grace, to give that grace freely because it's been given to us. That amazing grace has been given to us. Mm. We can give amazing grace to others. So yeah, the milk got left out and now it's spoiled. And it was hard to get that milk because you had to, you know, you only got one, right? And so, ah, and we're going to need to take a step back. We're going to need to, to take that deep breath or 10 deep breaths or go for a walk or whatever it is, but to figure out what it might be also sort of bringing up in us that isn't at all about that child and that milk. Kids do things that are vexing to say the least. And I certainly do my share of things that are vexing to say the least. So if there's one thing that I'm still trying to learn and to live, and I'm encouraging all of us to learn and to live is to remember the amazing grace that's been given to us. And every day we get many, many, many chances to extend that same grace and to look for the good instead of being tripped up with one more thing that validates what we thought about that person that's not necessarily a strength or a positive. Um, and to, and to, really, um, to really shift, to be willing to make a shift and and look at things in a little different way because we all need the grace right now. We significantly need the grace. Our kids need it, we need it, our spouses need it, loved ones, people that we're living with or even seen from afar. A little grace goes a long way. Mm, that's so good, that's so good. Amen. Amen. All right, we're approaching an hour here and I know that a couple of you have to jump off as you have some other things you need to um, attend to. And once again, thank you each one of you for your time and for carving out from your practices and the other obligations that you have in life in order to be able to jump on with us for this. Um, but real quick, could each one take uh, just maybe one or two minutes and give us one or two practical ideas of what to take away from this um, from today? Dr. Braley, your face popped up first, so you get to go. <laughs> uh, I guess when I'm thinking about the way in which families can lead their members, it has to do with being able to go to scripture and use the, the holy truth to reinforce what's being experienced. And I think about Matthew and the Beatitudes that tell us, blessed are those that mourn. And it's the full array of paradoxes that inform our lives as Christians that this is something intended of God for our good and not of evil. And that we can have the faith and the assurance that um, God will use this for his blessing, his exaltation, and for our gain. And that uh, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not yet seen. But be grateful and manage your life in ways that involve the suffering of loss, the endurance of the pain and the anguish and the unknown, but also revert back to and underscore the need to be grateful and practice that attitude. Awesome. Thank you again for being with us. Pat. I would say uh, seek the truth. That is... Mm -hmm really important whether you're talking about the practical truth of you know not eating 25 bananas as some of the <laughs> newscasts have talked about um, or gargling with with bleach or whether it's the more um, sinister thing of scams that people are trying to get through to you on email or whether it is understanding the truth that God loves us that God loves you he is with you every step of the way of this just seek the truth and keep seeking it. Awesome. Thank you, Pat, for being here with us. Susan. Something I've learned along the way, my final prop, is recognize the and in things. Definitely yeah. when we think about and, um, I, I'm a person that kind of wants to put things in neat little boxes. Right now we are dealing with so many things and a lot of what we're going through is horrific. And there is new life coming from this very dry ground. So mm. Um, on a daily basis, hold both of them. The fact that what we're going through is super difficult, tough, challenging, and life-threatening. And 
we're seeing some of the best parts of people coming out and God is with us through all of it. Wow, that's so good. Thanks so much, Susan, for that and for being here with us. Um, I have slight asthma. It's not like super bad that I, you know, have to think about it all the time, but the reality is, is I, I do have asthma. And if I don't pay attention to that, it will show up in my life and it will change the way that I get to move around and do life. If I'm going to go biking with my kids or if I want to try to go for a run or something like that, if I'm not paying to that inner something within me, you know, the way that my body reacts and the way that my lungs uh, contract and all that type of stuff, it shows up in my life. And not only does God want us to be physically healthy, he wants us to be emotionally healthy. And there, there are just different things that are going to come to the surface during this time in our lives. And really the, the idea behind this panel and behind getting all these thoughts is I, I firmly believe that God wants us to come out of a season like this as healthier, more mature people. Um, and I think that's why he allows us to go through these things. I, I love James uh, 1, 2 through 4. It says, consider it pure joy my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, obviously this is a trial of one of those kinds. So James is telling us to consider a pure joy, which is not what we oftentimes are, are hearing, but because in verse three, you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And then it says, let perseverance finish its work. Why? So that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So I believe that what God really wants here is to continue that mature, maturation. There's a really good way of saying that word. Um, he wants us to continue to grow in maturity and for us to become complete, for us to, be, to live the life that he's called us to. We all know what life should look like, but we're caught in the middle of what is, and we have to keep moving into what ought to be. And so my hope is, is that as you are watching from wherever you're at, that you won't simply go through COVID-19 and just merely get through to the other side. My hope is that you'll come through the other side and you'll always, for the rest of your life and for your family's life and for the people that you do life with and get to share your life with, that they'll look back and they'll see how God transformed you in the process of going through this period of time. At least that's my hope for me. Um, so thanks for watching. Thanks for checking in. A couple quick things before you click off today. Um, in the section below uh, here on Facebook, if you're finding us on YouTube, go over to Facebook, go to Family in Christ uh, Facebook page, and then you'll see in the threads, we'll have different links to different things. Or I've asked each of our panelists to give a couple different books or podcasts or different resources um, that we can link in order for you to do something. So in the next month here and the rest of April, do something push into this, ask God, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you of, of all these different ideas. And maybe you need to go back and listen to this whole thing again, you know, and ask God that, that big question, what is it that you want me to key in here on? What is it that you want me to pay attention to? What, what makes my heart beat a little bit faster? What makes me a little bit nervous? What's the thing that I almost would, uh, would have a hard time sharing with someone else about what's being churned up inside? Pay attention to those things. And then try to connect with some of these different resources. These panelists, would they'd love to help you out. If you have a question, feel free to email them. You know, they're happy to set up a time and just chat with you for a little bit. And they can point you towards a lot of other resources. Another thing I'd love for you to do before you click off, go ahead and share this video. We would love for this to be viral. Not because it makes us look great, but because I feel that the information that these um, friends of ours have brought to us is so valuable and so good. So would you simply just share that with other people on your Facebook page? So that way this would spread not just to other people in family in Christ church, but all over the place. And, and we firmly are believing and, and are praying that these messages of hope um, will find uh, lots of people out there who need it. So once again, uh, Dr. Braley, Pat, Susan, thank you guys so much for being with us. Oh, and one last thought. If you have another idea for us, um, we did conquering COVID-19 financially and now emotionally. We're going to take a break this next week because uh, this next Wednesday is in the middle of Holy Week and we want you to pay attention to Holy Week. But then after that, we could probably do another session or two. And so if you have some ideas of stuff you would love 
for us to talk about, go ahead and enter or you know do a little comment below and let us know some of your thoughts there. But until then, we're praying for you. Um, oh, uh, man, I could just keep going on. So one more PS, PSSS, um, especially for those people who are single and are not in the middle of the same kind of family craziness. Um, we'd encourage you to be part of a, a church family, um, a family that wants to embrace you, wants to be there for you. We know how easy it is to feel segmented and lonely and all of those different times. And especially in a lockdown, it, it can be even harder. So please reach out to um, your family of faith. If you don't have one, we would love to do life with you here at Family in Christ. So have a great night or day or morning whenever you're viewing and watching this. And we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.